Welcome to Practical Planning for Aging. This session is going to, we have two stellar presenters for this session. The first is Ayanna Woods, who is the Executive Director of End of Life Choices New York. Ayanna received her Master's in Health Education from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her undergraduate degree from Princeton University. She's the past director of, NA, of education at NHF and helped launch the Steps for Living website. Christy Humphrey is a licensed clinical social worker at Hemophilia of Georgia for the last 20 years. She received her master's degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and also has a degree with an emphasis in geriatrics. So in order to get the most from this, from this session, you're going to use the chat box and you can write questions or comments and just jot them down because we'll be able to respond in the chat throughout the session. You can also follow, uh, use email questions to the speaker using the ask a follow-up question for a response at a later date. Make sure to give additional feedback, please. We take the evaluation super seriously, so make sure you give additional feedback by filling in the evaluation at the end. All presentations are recorded and be, will be available to watch later. All three of our speakers, including myself, Marla Feinstein, will have, we have nothing to disclose. And with that, this is our agenda for this session. First it will be practical planning for aging well, and then it will be practical planning for end of life. And with that, I give it to Christy. Congratulations, you made it to old age. Our community has been working towards a normal lifespan for generations. And so here we are. Developments in hemophilia care have changed outcomes for people with bleeding disorders and normal aging is amongst us. So what do we do now? Slide. So there's an old adage from Betty Davis, old age ain't no place for sissies. And what's interesting about the bleeding disorders community is I haven't met a lot of sissies. So you know what it is to be, have adversity. You've done that and you got the camp t-shirt to boot. So let's take on aging. Let's do this thing. But it is a big topic and everyone thinks and feels something about it. How do we maintain balance in the midst of something this big, aging, illness, and dying? Oh my. In psychology, the first step to coming to terms with something is to accept reality. And I love Fred Rogers' quote, anything that's human is mentionable, anything that's mentionable can be manageable, when we can talk about our feelings, they become less overwhelming, less upsetting, and less scary. The people we trust with that important talk can help us to know that we are not alone. So let's do this together. Let's walk through this together. And so let's look very deeply at what it is to age. And so first up, what is that slide? So this is the way that it works with aging. You can see from this slide that there's a whole lot of physical changes that go along with aging. And 50% of American adults have a chronic medical condition. It is important to remember that most people have to change something in their lifestyle just because they are aging. The body has losses, it has changes. And so we need to come up with some kind of way of having emotional balance around those changes. And so since we've got lots of experience with adversity and change, this means we already own the skill of adaptability. So we can choose to bow deeply to each one of these physical type changes. So each thing on this slide has a way of balancing it. So for example, your bones become more brittle as you get older. So you need to talk to your doctor about increasing calcium, increasing vitamin D, increasing dairy products, almonds, vegetables, broccoli, kale, all are high in calcium and vitamin D. And so we also may need to look at calcium supplements. Because your heart has to work harder, once again, what's the antidote to that? You stay active. Swimming is a wonderful way 
other moderate exercises like walking each day can st help you stay at a good weight, keep your blood pressure down, and balance that issue of your heart having to work harder just because you're getting older. Your skin feels different as a third example. Hot water actually dries skin out. So take warm baths instead of hot. Showers. Wear sunscreen and protective clothing when you go outdoors to protect your skin. Look for moles. Go talk to a doctor if you see any changes or wrinkles. These things are normal. Slide. Nutrition. Ah, once again, nutrition needs. Um, these are wildly important, especially because there can be interactions with food, um, with medication. So things like grapefruit, chocolate, licorice, alcohol, all need to come into question and you need to have a conversation with your doctor around what should you be doing different. Also remember that thirst goes down and taste changes. And so um, making moderation uh, a key part of what's going on and talking to your physician about exactly how much water do you need to be drinking? How do you make that happen in a day and creating a plan around that? Slide. Psychological and neurological changes. Because there is change in life, and one of the definitions of stress that brings it up is change, one of the things that we have to do is work on a plan around stress management. But unfortunately, as we get older, our biochemistry has some changes as well. And so we need to have a plan around that as well. So acetylcholine is, is different. And keep in mind, these, these are huge biochemicals um, that help us to feel good and, and they uh, support memory as well. And so it's really important to come up with a plan around stress and allow for the fact that the body doesn't recover from stress quite as easily as we get older. But what's interesting is through things like meditation, you can actually impact the role of stress and increase the number of dopamine receptors in your brain, as well as help to moderate acetylcholine just through behavior. But noticing is the first step. So we need to notice what our thought process is and then realize that when the stress comes up, that we need to have a plan around about. Uh, around it. Also, our relationship with aging is very important as well. Although we may feel one way inside, when we look in the mirror, we may see something very different and it can be a little bit of a shock. And so coming up with a plan around and asking deep questions, what do I really believe about aging? What does it mean to me, especially the fact that we, we have a lot of role change, retirement, empty nest, all of these things come into play. But once again, realizing that, seeing that, working with either a process, a doctor, a psychiatrist, a psychologist, all of these things can help us to create balance in the midst of it. Slide. So creating a plan also includes looking at some of the risks of aging. In mental health with aging, one of the things we talk a lot about is dementia, delirium, and depression, the three Ds of aging. So we have to see these shadows. And in all honesty, with everything that's on this slide, we could talk literally all day about each and every one of them. So I'm going to pull out just a few of these. But one of the things that I want to talk in particular about is isolation. See, because people usually outlive their ability to drive by six to 10 years. And so as a result of that, isolation can create more problems with depression. And when you have a chronic medical condition, you have an increased risk of depression as well. And so we've got to find protective factors even in the midst of understanding that isolation is more of a problem. 
This is isolation is also difficult for caregivers because schedule is so important, especially for when you're working with dementia and depression. It can be years of sameness and that years of sameness really can create problems for caregivers because you need a variety of inputs into the brain. And so connecting uh, with other people also helps to regulate the stress cycle in the body. We are not islands. We need physical support. We need emotional support. We need social support. And so finding some way to connect even though you're a caregiver, even though you may not be able to drive anymore, all of these things require a plan. And then the last thing I want to mention is delirium. Medication works differently in people that age. Also, delirium can come along not only from alcohol, drugs, it can come from malnutrition, dehydration, sleep depri deprivation, and emotional distress, pain, urinary tract infections, all of these things can create a delirium. That's really important for our community in particular to understand because we do use powerful opioids on a regular basis. And as the body ages, it might metabolize those opioids differently as a result. And so caregivers need to know, a person needs to know, even though I take these medications to manage pain, that I need to be aware that if some of the um, symptoms of delirium come up, I need to work with those directly. And it's not a condition that a lot of doctors are going to think of right away. Just like in hemophilia care, it's a really rare condition and not every doctor is going to be aware of it. This is not going to be something that a lot of doctors are going to think about because training and aging is just like hemophilia. It's not as usual. And so we need to look for quick changes in mentation. If things come on rapidly, we need to think about delirium. It can cause a person to get stuck in an idea. It can cause very poor memory, disorientation, rambling speech. We know something is wrong here. And especially if alcohol and medication are used at the same time, once again, delirium needs to be considered in the midst of that. And slide. So creating a plan, having a way of coming at uh, aging is so very important. Looking at exercise, seeing a doctor regularly, really considering what the options are around getting around your community and driving. Independence is another thing. Um, making sure you find ways to do everything that you can do. If you don't use it, you lose it, is the mantra in aging. And so finding ways to stay mentally active, finding ways to have stress reduction techniques, finding ways to have pain management that's not just about a pill. It turns out that cognitive therapy and mindfulness-based stress reduction actually decrease pain symptoms at about 50% levels. Imagine if you stack that along with medication, what kind of outcome you may have. And of course, alcohol. As we age, once again, we metabolize things differently. It's very important to look at the effects of alcohol on our lives. And by the way, it affects platelets as well. And so in the bleeding disorders community, we'd be working with two problems, not only a genetic bleeding disorder, but a problem with platelets um, when you're consuming alcohol. So really look at um, the broad picture of what it's like as your body ages, because it is a very personal situation. Slide. And so one of the last things that I want to talk about just a little bit about is be sure to prepare for the worst. Always, always, once a year, it's important to review everything about wills, estate planning, Durable powers of attorney are also very important. One of the things that people talk about, well, I have a power of attorney, but the durable part is not, um, is not becomes important if there's any sort of uh, dementia that comes along, because if a person becomes incompetent, that 
power of attorney actually will stop. And so finding ways to have durable powers of, of attorney, making sure you're communicating your financial issues to other people in your world so they know exactly what to do with what's going on. And then insurance. Be sure you know what's going on with medical insurance, life insurance, long-term care insurance. And then travel insurance is my new thing to talk about. I had a client and he agreed that I could talk about this openly. He traveled to Canada and unfortunately had a devastating bleed while he was in Canada and wound up with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical bills because it turns out that his insurance didn't go out of the country. So being sure to review, especially if you're traveling, exactly what kinds of insurance you have, consider travel insurance, consider the options that you have, because in the end, all of these can affect your financial well-being as you get older as well. And remember that the stress cycle shuts down the logic center. If you wait to handle these situations in a crisis, you're not going to be able to deal with them on a regular, you're just not going to be able to think through them as well as if you take some time out every year and just review this information on a regular basis, make sure that all your I's are dotted and T's are crossed so that the person that you have helping you and your caregivers can help as well. One of the things that um, also can come up as well is that the person with a bleeding disorder may become a caregiver of someone they love as well. And so making sure you, you know as a person with a bleeding disorder what the plans are for the people around you too. Plan for everyone, not just for yourself too. Slide. Knowing the resources that you have available to you is also another thing that's very important. The National Institutes of Health has an aging section. They have wonderful information on nutrition and, and exercise. They have information on Alzheimer's disease and basic information about what it is to age. And so those websites are really helpful um, in helping yourself to kind of understand what it is to age on a regular basis. Consider using uh, uh, resources in the community as well. The Area Agency on Aging all have local contact numbers and they will assist anybody over the age of 18 who um, is considered fragile. And so you can use them to help with planning. They usually do one-stop shopping for resources as well, so you can get assessed for nutrition programs, you can get assessed for Medicaid waiver programs to help with homemaking in the house anything that you might need. United Way also has wonderful resources as well. And then geriatric case managers um, are really helpful. And then elder lawyers have uh, targeted information for people as they age to help with the financial part of planning as well. Slide. So I'm going to turn the presentation over to Ayana, and she's going to talk a little bit more about the planning process of aging and dying. Thanks so much for your time. Hi, everyone. My name is Ayana Woods. I'm the Executive Director of End of Life Choices New York. Uh, as Marla mentioned earlier, I was the former Director of Education for National Hemophilia Foundation a couple of years ago. I was in that role for about four years. And I was involved with many uh, annual meeting planning and presentations. So I'm really excited to be back today. Really excited to be able to learn the new information I've gained as the executive director of this new organization to bring it back to the community and talking about end of life issues, which I think are really important and rarely discussed. Next slide. So today I'm going to go over a couple of things, healthcare proxies, living wills, and other advanced directives a little bit about palliative care and hospice, and how to communicate with loved ones and your doctor about your end-of-life care wishes. Next. So what are advanced directives exactly? Next. So if you're an adult with an ability to make decisions for yourself, you always have the legal right to request treatments or have your medical treatment stopped. For example, you can tell your doctor to turn off your respirator or remove your feeding tube or stop dialysis, 
and the doctor must either comply or refer to a different, you to a different doctor who will stop the treatment. But what if you have dementia or are very sick and are unable to communicate or make your own decisions? If a patient can't communicate, most doctors will err on the side of keeping them alive. Even if a friend or family member knows what treatments you would or would not want, they may not have the legal right to make medical decisions on your behalf. That's where the advanced directive comes in. An advanced directive is paperwork that will protect your right to have your healthcare wishes respected if you lose the ability to communicate. And with the right kind of advanced directive, your wishes will be known and the chances of their being followed will be greatly increased. Next slide. So there are a couple of types of advanced directives, um, with the most common being the healthcare proxy form. There's also living wills um, and other documentation of wishes, DNRs, um, something called medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, a MOLST, or physician orders for life-sustaining treatment, which is called a PULST. Next slide. So um, you can see here, this is an example of the New York State Healthcare Proxy Form. I'm with uh, End of Life Choices New York, so I'm a little skewed to New York, but generally the form will look a little something like this. And I strongly recommend that everyone 18 years or older should have a healthcare proxy form. So that's the first thing I'm gonna discuss today. Um, as I said, this will look different in different states, but kind of latching back on to what Christy said, um, you want maybe the caregiver in your family as well. So I encourage you to talk to other family members about having healthcare proxy forms, as well as thinking about having one for yourself. As I said, we recommend that everyone 18 years or older has a healthcare proxy form completed. Next. So um, if you're injured or become ill and unable to communicate or make decisions, someone else will have to make decisions for you. And the healthcare proxy form is a document that simply names someone you trust as your proxy or agent to express your wishes and make healthcare decisions for you if you're unable to speak for yourself. And if you have not filled out a healthcare proxy form, there's a big risk that your healthcare wishes will not be known or honored. So in New York State, we have a law called the Family Healthcare Decisions Act, which was passed in 2010. And it pretty much designates who can make decisions for you if you don't have a completed form and other states might have similar laws. It pretty much defers to your spouse. And then if you don't have a spouse, it'll defer to your children, adult children. And then if you don't have those available, then your parents and then your siblings and then someone else. Now the challenge there is, well, what if that's not the order in which you want people to make decisions for you? What if you have two parents that disagree, multiple brothers and sisters that disagree, children that disagree? So it's really important to designate one person who understands what your wishes are and will speak for you when you can't speak for yourself. Next. So since your agent will make medical decisions if you're unable to, you must discuss your wishes with them and document your wishes. You can't simply say, I'm going to have Susan make decisions for me and never tell Susan and never tell Susan what you want. That's not helpful. So there are two lines of thought about the best way to specify your wishes, and it's really a matter of personal preference. The first way is just to state your general wishes without getting specific. For example, you might say, if there's no expectation of recovery, and I am suffering. I do not want to be kept alive by machines. Or I want everything possible done to keep me alive. Then you trust that your healthcare agent to make, will make the specific decisions that arise in the course of your treatment because you've had conversations and they can understand what you want. Um, and so for this reason, it's, it's really much better to have this person um, designated as a healthcare agent, have these conversations, and kind of determine what school of thought will work best for you. Next slide. So um, in continuing these conversations with your healthcare agent and thinking about what you wanna write on your advanced directive, um, you need to think about different ways to document your wishes. So another way is to specify what you would or would not want. It can be difficult to predict exactly the circumstances you'll be in if you were ill and, un and unable to communicate. We would have never predicted a global pandemic. So we would have never predicted anything like this in our healthcare wishes. So many professionals advise their clients to keep things simple and let their healthcare agent use their best judgment. However, some people want to get specific about what kinds of treatment they do or do not want. For example, if you have dementia, you may una be unable to feed yourself. And so a caregiver may place food on a spoon or other utensil and place it in your mouth. Some people would not want this if it's not would prolong their lives when they have late stage dementia. Other things to consider would be artificial respiration, which is the use of ventilator or other device to breathe for you. And this of course is coming up a lot due to the COVID-19 pandemic. 
artificial nutrition, which is the use of feeding tube through your nose and your throat, uh, which is surgically placed in your stomach to help you eat. Artificial hydration, which is when a small tube is placed in a vein through which fluids can be given to you. Um, at CPR, uh, it's an effort to keep your heart beating and lungs breathing if your breathing stops or heart stops. And antibiotics are given if there is a known or suspected bacterial infection, but can carry some side effects. If your life expectancy is low and you may, wish to, you may wish to consider if you would prefer to receive antibiotics and in what circumstances. For example, you may want it if it'll make you feel better, but not if it, it will make you feel worse or prolong your suffering. And so these are just some examples of things to consider. These are very, very personal decisions and there are no right or wrong answers. And if you change your mind later, you can always revise the form. Just make sure to let your agent know and give a copy of the new directive. And your wishes can be listed on the healthcare, healthcare proxy form or in a separate document that can be stapled to the form. Next slide. Um, here are some examples of what someone might want to write down on their advanced directive. If I become terminally ill, I do don't want to receive the following types of treatments. If I am in a coma or have very little consciousness, conscious understanding with no expectation of recovery, then I do don't want the following types of treatments. If I have brain damage or a brain disease that makes me unable to recognize people or speak, there is no expectation and there's no expectation that my condition will improve, I do don't want the following types of treatment. These are just examples and you should consider the different circumstances that would inform whether a treatment is right for you. And once again, there's no right or wrong answers. It's just what's right for you. Next slide. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, the DNR. Once again, this is the New York State Department of Health DNR form. Next slide. So a DNR instructs medical personnel not to revive you if your heart stops beating or you stop breathing but it only covers these circumstances and not other situations. For some people, it's important that everything possible is done to keep them alive, while others feel that they would not want to be resuscitated. Reasons someone might not want to be resuscitated include, but are not li limited to if they are terminally ill, or when the likelihood of survival is low due to age or other factors, or if they're worried that if they do survive, there is a risk of brain damage that would stop them from returning to the life they had before the incident. These are very personal decisions once again, and there are no right or wrong answers. And if you do not want to be resuscitated, you should talk to your doctor about a DNR. A DNR must order must be signed by a healthcare provider, and it should be easily located. If an ambulance comes to your home and they do not see a DNR, they will likely try to resuscitate you, no matter what your family members may tell them. And if someone has a DNR and wants to increase the chances it will be followed, we advise them to post it on the inside wall next to the front door. So then the ambulance comes, the technicians will see it. Next slide. Um, so just wanna talk a little bit about a living will. And once again, this is something that differs um, in each state too. But the living will is a formal written document in which you list the types of treatments you would or would not want under various circumstances. And this form should be given to your healthcare providers and healthcare agents. So in New York State, um, your healthcare agent trumps your living will. Because once again, you can't predict all circumstances, things are nuanced, you might not know a specific situation that will happen. So the healthcare agent will, become, will come in and be asked to make certain decisions outside of your living will or something that might slightly go against something you wrote in your living will because things are nuanced and different. Um, but if you have a living will, usually they involve a lawyer um, and then there's different requirements with a notary and things like that but you can really get into detail what you would and would not want. And some people in their living will actually put that they want their healthcare agent to sue the hospital if the hospital does not follow their end of life wishes. And then um, didn't include on this slide, but just referring to uh, what I mentioned in terms of the most or, or post form, uh, their medical orders of life sustaining treatment. That's what they're called in New York and across the country. They're called physicians orders of life sustaining treatment. Um, and these are also opportunities to document your wishes regarding CPR, artificial hydration and nutrition, antibiotics and comfort care, as well as other topics. It does not replace a healthcare proxy form, and it must be signed by your healthcare provider or by your healthcare agent or surrogate. 
And because it's signed by a healthcare provider, it's much more likely to be honored, the living will, because it's considered an official medical order. And these forms are often used by people who don't have close family members or friends that they want to designate as a healthcare agent. So they're, in a, in a sense, designating their healthcare provider as the agent who will make decisions for them. Not all healthcare providers are willing to sign these forms. And some of those that are willing will only sign it if you're expected to, unfortunately, die within a year or in the, die in a nursing home. Um, next. Next slide. Okay. So now we're going to talk a little bit about palliative care and hospice, just to give a quick overview. They're offering your best chance at good quality of life throughout an illness and as you near the end of life. However, they are relatively recent developments in healthcare, and most people know very little about the benefits they provide. A lot of people think hospice is only for the last few days or weeks of a person's life, and that's simply not the case. If a person starts palliative and hospice care at the earliest opportunity, they can have a much better quality of life for their last months or even years. Next. Um, so hospice, okay, so we'll start off, sorry. Um, people often talk about the difference between palliative care and hospice. It's a little complicated and people often get them confused. But palliative care programs provide treatment to prevent or relieve pain and suffering and improve the patient's quality of life, both physically and emotionally. In these programs, um, you do not have to be terminally ill. You can, and you can continue to receive curative treatments like chemotherapy and radiation. And you have to be hospitalized for a serious illness. We strongly recommend you find a hospital with a palliative care department and ask what services are provided by that department. Some only deal with pain management, whereas others offer psychological or spiritual support or art therapy. However, um, unlike hospice, which I'll discuss in a moment, these programs are not typically 100% covered by Medicare and what is included varies from hospital to hospital. Next. So what is hospice care? Hospice is a type of palliative care for individuals at the end of life. And there's a lot of myths and misconceptions about hospice and unfortunately it's underutilized. But in hospice care, each patient is assigned a team typically consisting of a doctor, a nurse, a social worker, and a chaplain, rabbi, or other spiritual counselor, if that's so desired. The team meets regularly to discuss the patient and their needs, and they manage pain and other symptoms and offer counseling and emotional and spiritual support to both the patient and their family. Hospice can take place at a hospice center, a facility, or at a home. And if you wish to stay at home, hospices can enable you to do this by providing medications, medical supplies, and equipment like a hospital bed or wheelchair, as well as visits by a home health aide. They also offer grief counseling to family members for up to a year after the patient's death. Hospice is almost 100% covered by Medicare, and if you're younger, it might also be covered by your insurance, and Marla might have information to add about that. Um, and so in terms of thinking about uh, advanced care planning, hospice, palliative care, there's a lot of fantastic resources out there. Um, I would encourage you to go to the Conversation Project. It'll give you tips and tricks on how to talk to family members and friends about your end of life wishes, how to select a, the appropriate healthcare agent, how to figure out exactly what you want. There's also programs like Five Wishes. There's a lot of fantastic resources out there. And if you live in New York State, I would encourage you to reach out to my organization, which is called End of Life Choices New York. Uh, endoflifechoicesny.org is the website. And we offer free counseling and support and guidance in completing your advanced directive forms, as well as helping your caregivers and providing support. We have a lot of educational programs, handouts, resources, website, um, social media as well. So that's a very quick um, overview <laughs> that I've provided on end of life care. And so please um, ask any questions that you may have. Thank you. Hi, so welcome back. And now I'd just like to take a moment to ask you both, what do you feel like as in your years and working with the community, both of you, what do you feel as if is the most surprising thing that you want people to remember at the end of this? Let's start with Ayana. I think um, kind of harkening back to what Christy said, it's important to plan. This is all about planning. And I think that's key. And I think you know, people dealing with bleeding disorders have medical crises often, but planning for the end of life is not something people are always comfortable discussing. Um, and so I would just, the conversations need to be had in advance, 
in a comfortable situation when people aren't stressed or emotionally fatigued, um, where we can really discuss these issues comfortably and where people can remember what we've told them as well. Because I think one of the challenges I find in my work is that if someone is suddenly dealing with someone who's at the end of life or terminal, then um, it's hard for them to Google, it's hard for them to take in information. So I think planning in advance, making these decisions, even having the conversations early on in your teens, 20s, and 30s um, is a really important thing to do. And I'll, let me just, you know, take the moderator uh, uh, handle, but like that also implies to insurance, right? A lot of people didn't expect to live this long, and mm. there's a lot of future planning that needs to go on, specifically in this community, who are naturally aging into things like Medicare and naturally aging into different, you know, situations, and that those situations are very much devoted to allocating resources, developing plans, putting money aside. We heard a lot about um, insurance. Now, while I only really deal with health insurance, right, in a more uh, wide perspective, I will comment on travel. Travel is a big deal, right? And as you retire and as you age, you want to travel, which is kudos, you know, to you. Let's pretend that the pandemic is over soon and we could all travel together. But what I will say is that, like a lot of um, health plans, do you have some built-in travel component, especially, you know, Medicare acknowledges that, you know, you could, if you live here, you can go there. But there are different ways that you can adjust, but it involves planning. And I think most people, you know, no one wants to, A, think about what are the long-term consequences of any given situation, and B, everything takes time, you know. Christy, do you have any thoughts about what's the most important thing for your from your perspective don't forget the emotional reaction to something as big as aging illness and dying right and so i think most people are like sure i can plan my financial future but i don't want to think about that dying thing that's an emotional response that's an emotional decision right that you've just made and so if you have a way of working with the emotionality of it and have a plan around that too, then it's easier to kind of find those thoughts, catch them, and bring them right into the light. Once again, using um, Fred's conversation, if we can't see it, it's not human, right? We can't make it into something usual. And the reality is, once again, this is normal psychology to have a reaction to aging, illness, and dying. That literally happens for every person. The only thing that's a mystery is the when right? So it's this question of how are you going to work with that? And, you know, you've got social workers, we have mental health professionals in the community, you have friends, you have family, there's ways of talking through this stuff. And there's ways of, of making it um, less intense, right? The, the way that I like to describe it for my mindfulness training is called tempering the mind, right? You let it in just a little bit, you temper the mind around it, you have the conversations, and then you turn away from it for a little while, but then you come back again. That's one of the reasons why we actually have um, a healthcare decision day. It's literally the day after taxes every year, because what are the two things that are inevitable in life? Death and taxes. And so they, they chose that time actively to say, okay, once a year, you review your plans. What are your decisions? Because the reality is your decision at 18, like I want every measure to be taken because I'm only um, 18 and I want every possible option, even if I'm in a vegetative state, right, is going to be very different at 50 and is going to be very different at 80. And so these aren't decisions you make for a lifetime. I do it once and then I'm done right? You have to review them on a regular basis. And so I think that's one of the most um, surprising things for people is that, oh, right, this is going to bring up thought process. This is going to bring up emotional process. And I need to have a plan around that. Too. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just and say, to piggyback on that in terms of reviewing it, things like relationships changing. Um, yes. All those kinds of things are important times to rethink 
who your healthcare agent is, if you get married, if a relationship ends, if you know, children come into play or anything like that. I think you're right. There are these moments, these life-changing moments annually, but also when these life-changing moments happen to kind of rethink what you want um, at the end of life and who should make those decisions for you. I want to thank you both for taking the time and work with us on this issue. And again, I want to encourage everyone to fill out the session evaluation forms and just take a few minutes. They're easy. We do take them very seriously. Um, and we do incorporate all, um, all those suggestions. So again, thanks again for everyone and having this conversation with us. Enjoy. Thank you so much, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you.